Good morning, everyone. You are very welcome to the HSE Engaging Men webinar series, the What of Men's Health webinar. The panel will be delighted to receive any questions you may have. Please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your PC or laptop screen. If you're using an iPad, you will find this feature located at the top of your screen. Without further ado, I would now like to hand you over to Men's Development Network Training and Resource Development Manager, Lorcan Brennan, who, will who is the MC for today. Thank you. Thank you, Helena, and welcome everybody. It's lovely to have you back again if you're here again for the second or third time. And if you're here for the first time, you're very, very welcome. I'm delighted you can join us here today. As Helena said, my name is Lorcan. I'm from the Men's Development Network. And for our series in uh, men's health and engaging men, uh, this is the third in the series of four. So we've one more to go before we get to Christmas. So it's delighted that you can join us here for the What of Men's Health Day. Now, we're going to do something today with the help of some colleagues and friends. We're going to look at the What of Men's Health and we have some really good people with us here from different organizations. And they're going to highlight in very practical ways through using videos, conversation, and of course, you'll remember from before, we had our panel discussion as well. And out of that, we're going to have a conversation, as I say, based on the what of men's health. So we're delighted you can join us for that here today. Through the event, and it's already been said, but we have the Q&A, and if you want to use that for any reflections or observations, please do put up your questions there, and we'll answer as best we can for you. So it's also worth, I suppose, highlighting today that the conversations we've been having here over the last number of webinars are not based on a Greensfield site. We're based on, I suppose, a national men's health policy. We have an evidence base, and we also, of course, have the National Men's Health Training Programme. And to help us today to have the conversations that we need to have, we have a number of good people with us. We have Janice Morrissey, who is here from the Irish Heart Foundation. We have Peter Jones, who is here from Waterford Sports Partnership. And we have Helen Forrestal, who's here from the Marie Keating Foundation as well. And of course, we also have Fergal Fox here with us from the HSE. And Fergal will be along later on to tell us more about what's happening in the upcoming events, and especially what will be happening in November in relation to our next webinar as well. So I've said about the Q&A in the background, we have Colin Fowler, and we have Finney and Murray, and I think Noel Richardson's in there as well. And they'll be minding us in the background that Helena is minding us with our team in IMS as well for the hour that we're here together or the hour and 15 minutes. Now, as in the format for our other webinars, this is what's going to happen. We're going to have our three presenters. They're going to come on and share with us some slides or some videos. And then afterwards, we'll have our panel discussion. And then finally, we're going to have a word from Fergal, as I say, about the upcoming events and different things that will be happening, and especially in November. So do stay with us for that. But first up today, we have Janice Morrissey. And Janice is from the Irish Heart Foundation, and she's going to share with our, our experience of men's health as well and engaging men. And Janice is the director of the Irish Heart Foundation's Health Promotion Information and Training Department. She's 20 years or more experience in working in the area. And Janice, it's so good that you're here with us today. So I'm going to hand over to you, please, to share with us your experience of the what of men's health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorcan, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, just bear with me a moment and I'll just share my screen. That should be just coming up now. Um, so uh, thank you for the invitation to speak about the Irish Heart Foundation's Reboot at Men's Health campaign. Um, and we're just coming to a conclusion uh, with that campaign um, tomorrow as, as September ends. Um, the Irish Heart Foundation, as many of you will be aware, um, has been around for a very long time. We're the national charity for protecting hearts. Uh, heart health across the nation and we do this in a number of ways including uh, defending heart health through advocating for improved public policy through empowering people through our health promotion campaigns and programs one of, of which I'm, I'm pleased to talk to you about today and we also care for those who are affected by heart conditions and stroke. We've worked for a very long time uh, in the men's health space, and we've been very privileged to collaborate with a range of partners at a local and national level, uh, many of whom are, are represented in the icons here today. So we've uh, built up a, a wealth of experience um, in how to engage with men in different ways. 
And I rubbed this slide from the Men's Health and Numbers report that uh, many of you will be familiar with. And really just to illustrate that there are a range of, oh, apologies, my slides seem to have popped off there. Apologies. Apologies so much. Is that working okay for everybody? Not yet, you're nearly there. Back. Janice, if you'd like to stop your share and um, start a new one again. Apologies, Thank you. I'm not sure what happened there. Now, is that coming up for everybody okay? Yes, you're back, Janice. Well done. Thank you. Apologies. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, no so I just problem. wanted to illustrate the uh, range of ways that we engage with men through individual one-to-one -one engagement right through the, to the bottom of the pyramid in terms of lobbying for improved health policy to address some of the, of the determinants of heart health. My slides are not moving along now. Apologies. Technology is against me today. Okay, oh, there so you go. Uh, um, here uh, I am uh, going to talk about our reboot campaign, um, which, as I say, is just concluding now as we come to the end of, of September. And why did we focus on men's heart health? Well, there were a number of reasons. Sadly, one in four men die from heart disease and stroke each year in Ireland. So it is one of the main causes of, uh, of death in Ireland. However, the really positive news and the great opportunity for us is that, in fact, 80% of premature heart disease and stroke is preventable through a focus on healthy lifestyles. So looking at areas like diet, physical activity, smoking and alcohol. So that offers us a great opportunity to influence the uh, heart disease risk of the nation. And earlier this year, we were approached by an association called the Rugby Players uh, Ireland Association, which mainly works with former rugby players and supports them as they adjust to retiring from professional uh, rugby life. So it was a great way of allowing us to use the profile of the rugby players, many of, of whom are household names. And they were so keen to uh, share their support having been affected in their own community by heart disease and stroke. Many of you may be familiar with the uh, very sad stories of the loss of Axel Foley and more recently Gary Halpin uh, due to cardiac conditions. So they were so motivated to partner with us and use their platform and connections to raise awareness around practical ways to uh, improve heart uh, disease and stroke risk. So the key messages of the campaign, we primarily targeted men in that 40 to 55 year age group and calling uh, them to take action to improve their heart health. The message was focused on taking small sustainable steps in September and beyond. And we invited men to visit our website for information, tips and tools to support them on this journey. So we had a range of campaign resources on our website, including quiz, case studies, leaflet, a range of supportive information, um, information about our campaign ambassadors, and also a challenge for those who wanted to engage at a, a deeper level. Yes. Men's stories were central to this campaign, and we're uh, privileged to share some really powerful stories of men's uh, own experience of uh, heart disease and stroke. And you can see two of them represented here and they're available on our website. Um, and we also captured stories from our rugby player supporters as well, um, in terms of how they have adapted from the professional rugby life where they were so supported to um, be in peak performance and how they adapted uh, to life as a retired player and the challenges and uh, ways that they addressed um, keeping their heart health on the agenda. In terms of information, we provided lots of tips and, and tools around healthy eating, sitting less, being active, and a range of ways that could be easily incorporated into uh, your lifestyle. The quiz formed an important element of the campaign, and we were conscious that we didn't want to dictate what changes should be made, that it was more around providing a range of information and encouraging men to uh, reflect on their own lifestyle and identify what areas they might like to change 
in terms of uh, improving their heart health. So th they went through a short questionnaire and uh, that allowed them to identify an area or two where they could make changes. The leaflet uh, was produced as a way of um, provided some more uh, extensive information. So this was downloadable on our website and also um, hard copies um, are available as well. Um, and apart from the, the information, practical tips and tools around the various lifestyle risk factors, we wanted to focus on that kind of setting yourself up for success piece. So doing the quiz, which is also in the leaflet as well as the website, but also looking at how to kickstart your, your motivation, how to get in the right frame of mind, what barriers might you encounter, uh, what would be uh, enablers or supports um, that you could have in place to set yourself up for success. For those that wish, wish to have a little bit uh, more support, we invited them to take part in a reboot challenge. Oh, apologies. So that is where um, men could sign up for a uh, email journey over five weeks. And they received um, an email each week with a statistic around a, a relevant um, aspect of lifestyle behavior change. And they were offered three different options that they could choose to partake in for that particular week. So we're very conscious of offering people the choice that it would be relevant and sustainable within their own lifestyle and circumstances. So I'm pleased to say we had over three and a half thousand people sign up to this challenge and the vast proportion were men uh, on this occasion. So we're really pleased uh, that we were actually hitting our target group. So in terms of other supports that, that are available, there's our nurse support line um, available on an ongoing basis for any question, no matter how small or large, um, anything to do with preventing or indeed treating or managing heart disease and stroke. So that line is available um, every day, uh, every morning during the week, um, and also um, 24 hours, our support uh, email address is available as well for any query. And we have a range of expert cardiac nurses that are so skilled in terms of supporting you with any query that you might have. And for anybody who has experienced a stroke or a heart attack or any other heart condition, we have a suite of supports available and the contact details are there. And that ranges from um, basic information around how to treat or manage your condition, your entitlements, but also there are uh, closed Facebook groups and uh, support webinars, emotional support, peer-to-peer -peer support, and support for families and carers as well. So the, the full range of uh, supports available for anybody who has experienced heart disease or stroke. So we, I would invite anybody with an interest to make contact with my colleagues in the patient support uh, team. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share some of the details around our reboot campaign. It's still ongoing till tomorrow. So it's, uh, it's still there's still time to sign up to the challenge should you wish to do so. And just to bring uh, the slot to a close, I would just like to uh, share a very short video that just captures uh, our rugby player ambassadors. Thank you. One in four men in Ireland will lose their lives to heart disease or stroke. But 80% of these cases are preventable. We all know friends and family who have been affected. Let's make some changes. We need to give ourselves the best possible chance. Go to irishheart.ie and choose to reboot your life. I'm choosing to reboot my life. Will you? Thank you very much, Janice. That is a super uh, presentation, really clear, giving us all a real deep insight into the work of the Irish Heart Foundation, and especially and specifically around the what of men's health. Uh, and just to we'll bring loads of that over to the panel discussion uh, later on. So I really, really appreciate that uh, as an input to start off our webinar here today. So thank you very, very, very much. And that leads us really nicely, I think, up into meeting somebody else who's just come on the screen. Peter Jones is based in Waterford with the Waterford Sports Partnership. I know Peter for some years and uh, many of us might know him through even men on the move, but his fantastic experience of engaging with and for men in relation to their health. He's a super advocate in relation to coaching and supporting and adv adv advocacy in relation to um, raising awareness around the benefits of physical health activity. So Peter, really delighted you're here. 
Iran um, mute at the moment. So you're all yours when you want to come on and share with us your experience. Thanks, Logan. No pressure after that introduction. So thanks a million. Afternoon, everyone. Um, unfortunately for you, I've, I've no slides. So you've simply my voice and I've put together some video examples of what we're trying to do. So hopefully you find it useful. Uh, I'm delighted to be here to speak on behalf of all of the local sports partnerships um, from around the country. And I suppose our perspective in local sports, sports partnership land is like we're in a very, very privileged position to try and make a long lasting impact physically, socially, emotionally um, to the lives of men. Under the guise of physical activity, like we're trying to make sure we improve not only the life, but the lifestyles of men and the people who are, that are fortunate enough to share their, that life with them. Um, we haven't cracked it. We, we definitely don't know everything, um, but we're constantly learning and evolving by engaging with our stakeholders and partners. There's a few things that I, I'd like to share with you just about what we've used in trying to make sure we can engage men. Um, the first thing for us is networking and partners. Like the whole motto of we being better together is, is true. From us working with the HSC, working with social prescribing, national governing bodies of sport, community groups and clubs, we all have a common goal. And if we work together, we can obviously increase the amount of opportunities we can offer. But more importantly than that, the reach of men that we can engage with. A great example for us here in Waterford is we try to do a men's physical activity program in West Waterford. Great program, we thought it was fantastic, um, promoted it to the hilt, we had nobody. So um, an email and a text, no one will identify with me. They don't know me, they don't trust me, they can't engage with me. So we worked with a club, um, a club person contacted all the men, the men trusted that individual, they engaged with it and it was fully booked. So it's different ways how we use our partners to make sure we spread our message. And the second thing as well on that is like the life cycle of a man. Um, so as we speak from cradle to grave, if you're watching this now, and if you're a man, just think of your current situation, think of your background and how you were. And if you're female, think of a man in your life and just think how your physical activity levels have evolved through childhood, through your teenage years, your 20s and beyond. And I can guarantee every single person watching this will have a different version of um, a different vision of um, every man at a kind of different stage in their life. And I think that's the key thing for us, that all men are different. My generation of our mid 40s, um, the key question for us was to engage with men is like, when do men stop being physical activity? When do they stop um, playing sport? But the issue for my generation is we, we think we're invincible. So we don't need to exercise. So we usually go and coach, but is that physical activity? Like when I was young, I played outside, I climbed trees, I cycled to school. The older generation walked and cycled everywhere. But what are the next generation? What are our next men in, in a few years time? Will a 30 year old man remember a child of climbing trees or playing sport or cycling to school? Like life is evolving, society is evolving, like gaming, technology, phones, life skills of being able to talk to people. That's impacting men, not just on their physical health, but their social health. And we're also asking that older generation to embrace that. But sometimes that's confusing for people and they don't like it because they're not comfortable with it. Um, with physical activity, the same as life, we think there has to be a carrot. We all know we should be doing more activity, but how do we do it? How do we overcome that excuse culture? We don't have time. I'm too busy. It's wet. I have children, et cetera, et cetera. Firstly, for us, the big thing is the activity. Um, find out what men want, but also make sure it's fun, make sure it's accessible and make sure it's achievable. And also how men would see that. When we're looking at different stages of life, we need to look at men of different backgrounds. Some are introverts, some are extroverts, some want secluded space, others want open spaces. Some have children, some don't. Some have grandchildren, others don't. It's about making men realize that for their situation, they can increase their physical activity. Um, the promotion of that men message is tough. I don't use social media. Um, men of my age do use social media. So how do we get that key message across to people outside of our partners and our networks? Is it word of mouth or what platform? Um, I think there's a lot of great work that's occurred with women, um, particularly with women in sport with the can't see it, you can't be it campaign. And the same is said of men. We do over 50s programs. We don't get any man engaging. We do men on the move as Lorcan says. We get fully booked programs and 80% of those men are over 50. So sometimes it's that wording. Like we look at walking football. I'm a man, I'm going, I'm not going to play walking football. What am I walking for? Whereas Colin Fowler up north, they call it dander ball. So just by changing the name, they get full, um, a full engagement from men that are there. 
And the two final things for me then is from sports partnership land, it's what's our definition of success? Success is not about numbers. It's holistic. It's about the impact that we can have on men. Like every man is an island and any positive impact we have is a win. And this final thing then is sustainability. Again, what's our definition? Like, yeah, we try and lead men to water and hopefully they drink, but not everyone's going to do a rowing program and join a club. Not everyone's going to do a gym program and join a gym. But if we've impacted on that man so they're living a healthier life going forward, then for us, that's us winning. Um, anyway, enough from myself. I've uh, just under a five minute video here for you to have a look at, just giving some stories from men within Waterford of programs we have done previously. So over to you, Helena. So I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, what I do for exercise. And that kind of got me thinking, there's not more patronizing than somebody who's half your age and half your body weight, telling you how good exercise is and how much fun it is and how good you're going to look. You know, at my age, I don't want to look good, I don't think it's going to be fun. I just want to be a bit healthier. I want to be a little bit healthier and a little bit fitter. Uh, there's one thing I'm glad I joined the men on the move. I didn't know what in the building up to eight weeks ago. It's one of the best things I've done in a long time. My excuse to get me arse up off the chair. And the variety of exercises I think are, are excellent. You won't get bored with them. We continue to evolve in our quest to get men active by using many different platforms to try and increase physical activity and social interaction. We're all too familiar with the Zoom platform, but all sports partnerships are different. We work together as a network, but we also look individually at what is on our doorstep to work in partnership with clubs and organisations to motivate men to be active and hopefully provide a pathway for them to sustain physical activity levels. All men are different. Our job is to find that carrot that might inspire and motivate a man to take that first step to a healthier life. And when men are engaged by providing a safe, friendly and relaxed environment where everyone can achieve, we develop physical, mental and emotional well-being. But success is not solely based on numbers. It's the improvement on physical health, yes, but those hidden benefits of friendship, camaraderie and togetherness because we are better together. Uh, really enjoyed the tennis, uh, men's health week, so uh, looking forward to it. I think I'll definitely try it again. Really enjoyed the hour and uh, went quick, and as you can see, very worthwhile and energetic. Thanks a million, thanks for everyone involved. Hi everyone, I'm John Walsh from Waterford Mai Tai, and we're really excited to be working with the Waterford Sports Partnership for Men's Health and delighted to be offering free opportunities to the men of Waterford. And we hope to see you all on Tuesday evening at 7.45. Give it a try, you're gonna love it. Waterford Sports Partnership were delighted to work in conjunction with Waterford Gymnastics Clubs to launch our first pilot, Me and My Dad Do Gymnastics course. This programme involves 16 fathers and 17 children aged between 5 and 10 with the real aim of increasing flexibility and core strength environment, particularly when the children came across and they were able to coach their dads and give them a little bit of feedback on their shoulder stands. Is he good? Kind of. Kind of. Gracie, how's daddy with this gymnastics? Um, he'll be able to do better if he practices more. He needs to practice more. Are you going to help him practice? No. You're not going to help him practice? <laughs> no. And Barry, how do you feel gymnastics? Do you know what? I'm buzzing. This is our this is our second week of the father and child gymnastics, and it's been it's been brilliant, brilliant fun. It's been brilliant fun. Like for me, um, I think it's put me out of my comfort zone because gymnastics is not my thing. I'm the least flexible guy, you know, that you can find. And just put yourself out of comfort zone in a really kind of it's a really relaxed, fun environment. I think without having your kids there. It could have been a difficult thing to do, but having your kids there it was brilliant. What do you think? Just a, another thing as well is that we kind of often use the excuse of time, not having time to get exercise in. And it's kind of opened up my eyes to, like, you can actually exercise with your kids. You can actually do a lot of physical activity without really knowing it and actually spending quality time with your kids as well. Can't you? Partnership is vital to spread the physical activity gospel. But there is no better role model for a man than seeing another man that they can relate to. If they can identify with it, they can see it. The next step is they can be it. There's no better location for a man to improve than one that they can feel comfortable with and they enjoy. So this is straight from the horse's mouth. I'd like to thank Jess and Sarah for a brilliant session on Promoting the Move. In the last eight weeks or so, I've come leaps and bounds. At all times, it's always been safe exercises, pushing it to your limit, but no further. 
and I could just thoroughly re recommend anyone who's of my age, I'm, I'm late 50s, 60s, uh, who wants to get back into training and wants to make, avoid getting an injury, this is your best place to do it. By the time I get back to the car, I really feel good. A few endorphins are flowing, I don't know what it is, but I just feel good about myself and I feel better about the day. I suppose my thing with exercise is that there's no healthy body without a healthy mind and there's no healthy mind without an at least slightly healthy body. So my name is Steve, so I'd like you to join me in being your personal best this November. Pete, I'm going to try and say that word again, advocate. You certainly are, that was absolutely excellent and to hear the voices of the men and demonstrating again and following on there from Janice, another really clear piece of the what of men's health and I can't wait for the panel discussion. It's going to be really, really interesting with where we're going uh, in this webinar today. Just a really excellent video and some really excellent insights into the what of men's health. So please do stay with us. And uh, look at last but not least, we have with us, Helen is up there. Hello, Helen. Helen Forrest is here Hi, Larkin, how are from you? the Marie Keating Foundation. And thank you very much for joining us as well. Helen, you have loads of years, we won't go through the years, but you have many years of experience in what you've been doing. And the Marie Keating Foundation do fabulous work along the way as well. So we're so glad that you're here with us to add to the conversation that we've seen. Uh, that narrative is there, and I know you do likewise. So please take the, take the space to tell us about your fantastic work, and we'll join you on the panel as well then afterwards. Great. Come Thanks very much, Lurkin. Um, I am going to use some slides, so I'll just share my screen now, if that's okay with everyone. Um, Okay, so, so it's a privilege to be here today. Thank you so much. Um, I suppose going back the years, um, the Marie Keating Foundation would be well known um, for you know, uh, breast cancer awareness, but we have moved on year by year and we're delighted. We've come a long way um, and we are here for men in Ireland too and for their families and men's health awareness is really important to us. Um, and for many years, as we know, um, breast cancer has been uh, has been the goal, you know, the, the goalkeeper from Rekeating Foundation. But Ireland was one of the first in the world to adopt a national men's health policy in 2009. And we're really proud to be a part of that. And um, Stephen just said there in the video, you know, he talked about being a healthy man. And that 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 I think is our goal. A healthy man is one who is empowered to experience optimum physical mental and social well-being and to experience his health as a resource in their lives so the ultimate goal i guess um, <clears throat> so i suppose one of the reasons the Marie Keating foundation are so passionate about reaching out to men is that we know um, that cancer is the leading cause of death um, at around 33.1 percent for men um, but we also know in most circumstances we can help ourselves and that's why we are here this afternoon Janice alluded to this as well as, as Peter has. So we're all in this together, which is really nice. Um, so the desire to teach people to look after themselves and what to look out for um, in terms of breast cancer has been with the Marie Keating's, Marie Keating's family for, since 1998. She died from a type of breast cancer, which at the time was very curable. It was growing on the outside and very obvious. Um, but I'm sure like many people in the room today, you know, she was a woman in, in her generation who didn't like going to doctors, hated hospitals, appointments, so much so that she had all her children at home. And um, so, you know, she left her she left her cancer. She knew it was there. She didn't tell anybody. And unfortunately, it got to a stage where it, became, where it metastasized and spread to other parts of her body and became incurable. Um, and that is a hard lesson, I think, for people to learn. Um, so over the years, the Marie Keating Foundation has grown and evolved, and I'm really thrilled um, to say that men are on our agenda, um, and the link is getting stronger and stronger, and I'm here to give you some of those insights as to how that has evolved um, for men in Ireland over the years. So our vision is, is, is actually to have a world free from the fear of cancer, and our mission is to make cancer less frightening by enlightening. <clears throat> and again, our values are underpinned by family, um, you know, reaching out to families, men in particular, as we're talking about engaging men today and their families. Um, and we, we try to uh, portray positivity, hope and love even within that. 
Um, we, we actually offer inclusivity as well, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And of course, we have to be trusted um, as a charity. We all have to be trusted, and that's really important to the Marie Keating Foundation also. So our strategic goals are many, um, and they're divided into three kind of areas of, of support. Um, so prevention and awareness is what, what we're talking about a lot today. We have a mobile outreach service, which, which has always has an a, 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 sorry, a qualified nurse on board, and they reach the 26 counties of Ireland, and they go into remote areas. So we, we serve a lot of you know, people in underserved communities, and it can be very opportunistic, which is ideal. Uh, we have corporate wellness, um, um, key part of, of the service now, and that's grown over the last couple of years, and particularly online. Um, and I think really importantly, we have a schools cancer awareness program and that starts, you know, we start to engage with um, uh, youngsters in fifth and sixth year and in transition year and actually teach them about, you know, signs and symptoms of cancer, but also like beginning to teach them about reducing their risks and actually getting that conversation going about family history, knowing what your family history is like. Um, we have lots of awareness campaigns through the year. Um, particularly at, diff at you know, different times of the year. I'm going to talk a bit about Blue September, um, our prostate cancer awareness campaign um, for the purpose of, of, of this webinar um, and, and go into some detail about that. We also have a supportive service, um, which we're really proud of. Um, many people on a cancer journey in treatment are often financially burdened you know, by the cost of cancer. And we provide a comfort fund which can offer some sort of um, support um, in, in their need, in their financial needs. Uh, we have a metastatic breast cancer support uh, a service as well. Now, we know that metastatic breast cancer is mainly for women, but we also know that 37 men in Ireland are diagnosed with breast cancer each year. So we need to be very mindful of that and bring that into the conversation. Um, we have online um, support services that we run. Um, I suppose in COVID times, we've actually run them um, twice a month because they've been a very vulnerable group, very isolated and very lonely. We have a BRCA support group <clears throat> at the moment that is for women, um, but we are looking forward to bringing men into, the, into this conversation as well. Uh, we had an annual um, webinar last year and we included a urologist in that to talk about you know, BRCA and the risks of prostate cancer in, for men in Ireland. And we have a virtual hub, which I'll show you some links to later. Survivorship is huge. It's a very positive aspect of what we do now. There's over 200,000 survivors in Ireland. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about our Survive and Thrive program towards the end, our Positive Living program, and of course our Survive and Thrive um, uh, hub and web website. That could be quite specific to people who don't necessarily want to join groups or feel vulnerable, um, and they want to get their information from elsewhere and get some signposting to local cancer support services, which is really meaningful. So um, the Marie Keating Foundation and Men's Health, oh my gosh, we've had a fantastic time. Um, I have to thank everybody who is part of, of this forum um, for bringing us together. Um, I think, you know, for many of us in the room today, I really enjoy coming to these meetings. I particularly enjoy the Men's Health Forum where we start planning the year ahead um, for, men's health, for men's health in June. It's the height of activity. It's a really positive, energetic place to be. Um, and it has great leadership. Um, and I'd be, it would be remiss of me to actually not forget Lurkin, Finian, and Collie in this, and of course, Fergal. So acknowledging everybody that brings us together um, uh, and gratitude to all for, for these webinars. You can see here that we have had a great success getting into construction industry, sitting, talking to men. Um, we've also um, been invited into many of the men's sheds that has been challenging um, online, but we're still there and we're going back next week, which is really um, promising. But I must say, I have so much respect for these um, men who are, who, you know, they build their empires, but they build it for reasons of support, friendship and camaraderie. Um, and I think that's really important in COVID times. We also realize that people are still missing out who are not digitally, um, you know, do not have digital available. But um, I suppose if I went back to pre-COVID times, we we visited 45 men's sheds around Ireland, and, and that's quite an achievement within a year. Um, we have some very special projects running this year, um, one with Pave Point and one with Syrian men. 
And I have to say, you know, have a point, these men here, they're a wonderful group to work with. In fact, about an hour ago, um, one of my colleagues delivered a bowel cancer awareness uh, webinar to these men um, and, you know, they're, they're to their group of team leaders. So there, there is a way into these groups. Um, and the, the, the programs we deliver are very tailored um, to their needs and given in a very culture sensitive way. And I think that's really important. We're delivering one on prostate cancer on the 14th of October. Um, and I just mentioned the Syrian men. Um, we're working with local development networks in Offaly and Roscommon. They're a really difficult group to reach or to, to engage with at least. And we have had an inroad there through the, the, service, the social inclusion leaders. Um, it's fantastic. Football is on the agenda, of course, before we ever get to talk about prostate cancer. And that's been given in a very culture sensitive way by a male nurse, um, as they don't wish to have a female nurse um, in attendance. And that's absolutely fine. We get the message across the way we can. Um, and then just talking about get our Get Men Talking campaign. Um, I suppose our first, uh, uh, I suppose, introduction really to the men's health campaign was back in 2015. And we designed a Get Men Talking campaign to raise awareness on men's cancer. So generally we talk about prostate, testicular, skin and bowel. Um, and we've developed that over the years. Um, Peter said there is not, a, it, you know, it's, it, it, numbers aren't as important. It's about engagement um, and sustainability. And that's really important here. And um, we have actually grown, our, our, you know, the numbers of, of men we've spoken to over the years. But the engagement is really important and, and, and for them to come back. In 2016, we had a Get Men Talking campaign, and that again focused more um, specifically again um, at a deeper level on the conversation around um, different types of cancers. In 2017, we had our Heroes of Hope um, prostate cancer exhibitions. Finian in the room here supported us. We were in Connolly Station. It was a beautiful campaign. Um, you can see Tony Ward's story there. So really positive um, aspect of, of maybe the, the, the cancer he had been through and a positive outcome. Um, so sharing the positivity and the survivorship stories um, is really important. Um, and that exhibition was in Pro Park. So you might read about you know, someone having had prostate cancer on the way into Pro Park at Connolly Station or in some of the hospitals around the country. Um, and one of, the, one of the exciting projects here again in the same year was the Bloom Garden of Hope and Remembrance. It was a blue garden and you can see our ambassador there. There's, there's a, a wall of remembrance and men are coming along pinning blue ribbons for those they remember um, who, who they may have lost to any kind of illness over the years. Um, and one of the nice uh, connections here was that that garden was transported down to Solace Cancer Support Centre in Waterford to the men within that group. So men within that, that group who have had prostate cancer or other types of cancer. And they are nurturing that garden now and it's growing and developing. Um, and, and, you know, that's really um, great connection and engagement uh, for us and for them. Um, and in 2018, we just developed that campaign a bit further, getting friends and family involved. Um, and then we got to 2019 and we started looking, you know, at a, a different iteration, really. And this was like to get men talking. We're using the hook here. Um, Lurkin um, taught me all about the hook. Um, so we often use sports figures and comedians to get this message out to you all now. And I believe it works. It is, of course, all about men's health awareness and the support that, that can be offered, um, and it's getting it out there. Um, so in 2019, we had our sports celebrities and Senator Neil Richmond. Um, in 2020, we had our comedians there who delivered the messages for us. And this year, we're back to our survivors. So the men in Ireland who have prostate cancer and a positive story to tell. Um, and these are all done through social media, videos, you might have heard some of the videos and you might have heard some radio adverts. Um, there's a pin, I'm wearing mine here, if you can see it. Um, and I think this is a really good um, introduction to a conversation. Tony O'Donoghue and myself did an interview um, in Cork a couple of years ago in the Dohi and um, uh, Dohi O'Shea show. And, and in fact, you know, the conversation started around the pin, what is it? Um, watch, talk, act, stand up for your prostate, really important campaign. And like if you're wearing a pin and you're out and about, a conversation could start so easily about your prostate and health. So just bearing that in mind. 
Um, we have lots of um, leaflets uh, for those uh, around for prevention and awareness. Um, we are with people every step of the way here. Um, we provide infographics for education. We also have books that help people through difficult um, um, diagnosis, treatment, and supportive services on the other side. Um, and there is one there, particularly on prostate cancer. Um, I talked a little bit about, at the beginning about Survive and Thrive. And really, just to bring back to the connections we have in this room today, um, we did a, a six week, a four week webinar. Peter, you were part of that, and Dirk, and you were as well during the summer. And actually one of the men who is part of Peter's group is now um, part of our Survive and Thrive program running at the moment, and he's really enjoying it. Um, we, we found during COVID, it was difficult to engage with men again. So this Survive and Thrive program was put out for men only. Um, we couldn't fill it with men only, but we have seven very powerful men on, within that group now, and they're, they're really doing very well. Um, we have a positive living program for men with metastatic cancers. Um, that's starting tomorrow. So a lot of our new work and supportive services starting in September. Since 2014, we've been doing this work with women with metastatic breast cancer. And I'm really, really pleased to say we have five men signed up to this program tomorrow to start that conversation happening and to give that support around Ireland. Um, and there, there's a cancer and COVID webinar from, from last year as well. You can tune into those um, there's, there's some really good advice there on sleep and difficulty sleeping. You know, Peter's talked about keeping active. Janice has talked about um, diet, you know, um, and weight. Um, and we all talk about mental health in this space and um, managing stress and managing side effects. Um, and I also mentioned the survivorship portal. And um, BRCA is a conversation again, I think that we, we will bring to the fore for men um, in the coming year. And these are our hubs. Um, our virtual hub where you can actually get more information. The CARES webinar, I think, is really important. That was hosted by Dr. Eddie Murphy. And I think there's a lot of men in Ireland who are carers and, and we need to address that and we need to support them. Um, and I always love this, this, this aspect of looking after men. Men look good, feel better. You know, the makeup and the hair and the nails and the skin. Um, we do that for women, but we're actually doing it for men now. And they actually, we've done two and they really enjoy it. Um, and it opens them up to a conversation around skin health and, you know, um, it, it's as important for men as it is for women. And we have acknowledged that. Um, so what I would like to do now in order to, I suppose, to round off this session is introduce you um, to Tony O'Donoghue. He has a beautiful story to tell. Um, and this is for you. Yeah, well, I've had my own brush with cancer. It's about seven or eight years ago now, and um, I had this little lump on my neck, and I said, ah, oh, I'll go next week. Or, oh, it's, not that, it's not that big a deal anyway. But I was coming to do a, a programme in RT, and I had to go to makeup. And uh, Siobhan in makeup, who knows me pretty well, um, she said she wasn't too happy with that lump, and I said the same thing. No, it's nothing, I'll be grand. And she said, I've advised someone in the past about this, and I'm telling you now, you need to go and get that checked went for biopsy and stuff and then they realised that it was a, a tumour and that stops you in your tracks, that, that stops you thinking of the next match or the next broadcast. My father had prostate cancer and yeah, it was a long time ago and it was at a time when, you know, cancer wasn't spoken of. It was like, you know, it was, it was too big a deal, it was, it was too scary. Cancer was a killer. Simple as, you got cancer, you died. It was the big C, don't talk about it. Don't tell anybody. I remember I had just started my first year in, in UCC uh, when my dad, who had been sick, was brought to the Mercy Hospital. I remember bursting through the doors and I was running up the stairs, hoping to see my dad for the last time. And uh, the security man tried to stop me. And uh, my uncle behind said, it's okay, his father just died. And I didn't know that. I thought I was going down to see my dad for the last time and say goodbye to him, and it uh, didn't happen. And it really was uh, such a long time ago, and it's, it's, it's actually really tough. Prostate cancer 
took my dad away and it doesn't have to take people away. It, it, it's so eminently curable. It's easy to deal with, like, like lots of cancers now. And I think people should just get their heads around that. It's, it's the long term you have to think about. You have to think of your health, not for tonight, next week or next month, but for the years ahead. So that, you know, hopefully, and this is men, this is for men, you know, you can live a much, you can expect to live a much longer life than your predecessors, than your father or your grandfather. And thankfully for me, with Siobhan in makeup, I listened to her. She, <laughs> she made me listen to her. She scared the life out of me. And uh, she made me go and... You know, thankfully, I'm, I'm through that, as I say, seven or eight years later. Um, you know, it was, it was a terrifying time. I'm still scared of cancer, uh, but I'm still happy to stand up to cancer and look it straight in the eye and go, f*** you, cancer. <laughs> And thank you so much for sharing that and um, what a story mm. what a presentation as well for all of us here I'm just conscious that many people might be touched by that story uh, and Tony O'Donoghue tells it with such love and care and compassion the word intimacy strikes me into me you see you know and he really does mm. share all there with us so thank you for sharing that I'm conscious for people watching as well you know, sometimes we see a story that has touched our heart or touched our family and to be conscious of that uh, as well and find the supports that we need to talk and yeah. share, most important. And I, I'm going to bring everybody back, our panel here, Janice and Peter as well, to join us because, and you stay with us as well there, Helen, after that, because uh, we have our panel discussion and where would you start? I mean, after all of the inputs that we've had and maybe, Helen, if I can stay with you for a moment, uh, and just ask you first, to, after the presentation and after that video, you were part of that interview uh, with Tony, you said. What stayed with you after that interview? You know, I mean, there's a very powerful message of change and getting the support you need, but what else stayed with you, do you think, from that interview? Um, it's, 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 a, it's a powerful video. I suppose, first of all, I would like to acknowledge um, to anybody in the room who, who may have lost somebody and they weren't able to say goodbye, I think that is really difficult and it has, you know, in COVID times and this unprecedented times that's happened to many people. So just to acknowledge that. Um, Tony is a very powerful man um, and, he, and he's a very gentle man. Um, and he, he, he gave many stories there. Like I still, I still feel very emotional when I listen to him talk about his father. Um, there's no doubt about that. It's, it stayed with him for many, many years. But the way he tells it is, is actually, he's opened up to the nation. He's actually let the nation know that this hurt and it, it shouldn't hurt and it shouldn't need to hurt, you know, um, and he's still hurting. But he's also, um, I suppose, acknowledged within himself that he's still a bit scared. And I, and I know at the beginning, I, I'd said like one of our missions is to make cancer less frightening by enlightening. And that really is mm -hmm. the case. Like we don't really want people to be scared. Um, and we want we don't want people to procrastinate. We want need to we want people to come forward. And Tony has done that, and I think he's done it for us in in a way that people listen. And that is the hook, isn't it? Somebody um, with a profile who people recognize and maybe look up to. And he's in sport, so he's going to engage with men. He's telling them his story. Now, all of you here, and thanks for that, Helen, uh, and he is telling a story, and all of you here have told a story today, and I'm going to invite you to come off mute there, both Janice and Peter, yourselves, because I want you to come in on this, and you all demonstrated in your presentations and your slides and your, your conversations approach to what you said to us, um, the importance of engagement, and I know this is around the what, it is around the what of men's health, you know, and I'm just wondering when I was watching and listening I'm sure other people are as well, in relation to the campaigns that you've run, and you've all been part of initiatives and campaigns, what is it in your programmes that you feel really helped them to work well? If you were to dig down and say, well, what makes this programme a success? 
And Janice, do you, you know, in relation to the Irish Heart Foundation, and you, you talked about one initiative really today for the most part, you know, but you have so many initiatives that have been successful for engaging men. What do you think is at the heart of that? Thanks, Lorcan. I, I think there's a range of factors in our experience, and I think one of the key ones is flexibility. Um, offering a range of options or a range of ways of engaging. And I, like I spoke about that with the campaign today, that you know, some men are going to be more ready to engage than others. And it's it's you know offering them the opportunity to engage or whatever is right for them in the moment. I think that's really important. And Peter, you, you, I'm sure you'd agree with that, but what, anything you would add to that in relation to the engagement and you know the, the success of your own work? Yeah, you know, I think. I think the key thing for us is one of the things for us is you're never standing still. Um, and I think recognizing that we don't know everything. Um, one of the things from us when we first started doing men's programs, and, ah, sure, we'll pull this together and away you go and loads of men will sign up and it'll be great. And that's not true. Um, and I think one of those things is we don't deem it as a failure. It's kind of like we never lose, we learn. Um, so we're continually learning on what we are doing. We've, we've made not mistakes, but we've done things that haven't worked. But as long as we know why they haven't worked. But I think that key thing when you're looking at engaging with men is just not judging a book by its cover. Like, you know, a lot of people look at men and think oh, they're healthy, they're fine, they're grand physically and socially. But more often than not, they're not. And we all crave for that environment where we just want to go out and meet some guys and have a bit of crack. And if we can, for us, do a little bit of physical activity, then great. You know, we're, we're trying to, that's what we try and do with a lot of our things is we try and make sure the environment is right, that we, do, we never get that second chance to make a first impression. So when they come through the door for something we've organized, isn't that first thing of saying, hey, how you doing? And shaking someone's hand pre-COVID times. So, you know, that, that's massive. It's absolutely massive to get a connection between guys. And then sometimes the physical activity is secondary to that. But then it's brilliant because I'm serving two purposes. That's what we would find. Yeah. Lorcan, if I could just add to that, I think one of the things as well is don't assume that men won't engage. Um, because our experience has been once we've we've tailored things and understood where men are coming from and evolved men in the developmental process, the men actually do engage. Mm. So I think that's a really important point as well. I just add, Go ahead, Jeff. I just add to that as well, Dan, you're, you're bang on the button as well. Like one of the things that, that we would find is we've been a lot better now at consulting with men. Like, you know, I'm I'm 44, so I can't be going around, sure, everyone's like me. And that's, they're not, you know, everyone is different. So what a 18 year old man wants is different to what a 75 year old man wants, depending on their location, their isolation or anything. And it's making sure we engage to, you never know what someone wants until you ask them. So and that's huge. If you have that, then you can engage and you can make some sustained difference in their life. And I agree with that, Peter and Janice as well. Like where you know where we've we've done project work with Pave Point and <laughs> social inclusion, like uh, the Syrian group. It's what the men want. You know th those um, like focus groups have happened before we've even entered the room, and it's engaging with them in that way and understanding them um, and delivering what they want in their way. I think is really important. The other, the other important factor, I think, is the information sphere. Like, where do <clears throat> I've seen it in the, in the Survive and Thrive program that we're running at the moment? Where did where did most of these men come from? One of them came from, <clears throat> excuse me, from Peter's group. Um, he heard about the Survive and Thrive when we were doing a webinar, and he joined. And I was delighted he joined. And another gent had heard about our bladder cancer campaign. Like, give give bladder cancer the red card with Davy Fitz. I'm sure it was Davy Fitz he was listening to <laughs> and then realized that the campaign was about bladder cancer and he had bladder cancer and he joined up. So I think that, you know, that information sphere is really important. Where, where does the information come from? Is it from the local church? Is it from the local shop? Is it on Facebook? Where, where is it we need to engage, um, you know, with men? And I think with, with like Janice's service would be the same as well, where we're out and about in mobile units, we can, we could end up in the most remotest place. And actually it's an opportunity for someone. And I really like that idea because I often feel that, you know, people can't always afford to go to a GP or they'll think about it, they'll procrastinate about it. And if there's a, a unit there, maybe they'll just turn up. And that's really nice. Good. I think 
Go ahead. Think, well, sorry, look, I think that, as Helen said, it's like we've linked together myself and Helen, and we've mm. done work with the Irish Heart Foundation as well. Is there's no point three organisations being islands? Bring the three together, and we all have our unique expertise we can bring, so we can offer a man not just one thing but three things. And I think that's that's the key thing as well. Like if we can all work as a unit together for the shared, the, the common shared goal. You said at the start, I think, of your own presentation that, uh, you know, people are better together. We are better together. And you're demonstrating this here on the screen at the moment. In relation then to going and doing the work, you know, and engaging and having a program, do you think differently when you're setting out to do something for men? You know, uh, you have to think in a, through a different lens for, for engaging men and, and putting that action in place. Is that your experience, anyone? think so yeah like we like we did the father and child aspect because we realized we analyzed what we do and we realized hang on a minute we seem to be hitting a lot of men who are 55 50 plus so we worked on the 40 to 40 to 50 year olds but we are still getting nobody under 40 so we went well then we had to try and think outside the box and it, it worked really well like we still are struggling with the 18 to 35 age brackets and everyone can say ash are all men 18 to 35 are physically active no they're not they're not so um, and it's just about making sure what does that target group want? Like I, I spoke beforehand of like saying, do you know, like social media, I don't use social media. I don't I'm not on that. Whereas a 20 year old man nowadays, that might be all they do. So how can we influence and impact the decisions that that man makes at this stage of his life to increase that physical activity level? And it's trial and error, isn't it? It's as I said, it's making sure you try what you can do with your partners um, to make sure you can impact that man. Yeah. And I think, go ahead, Jeff, please. Sorry, I was just like, I suppose I would totally agree with Peter there. And in relation to our schools, Cancer Awareness Program, you know, we're invited into schools. It's a fantastic program. And one of the most powerful, probably, I suppose, modules within that program is testicular cancer. When you can get into the transition year, you know, students um, age 15 to 34, they start listening. It's the here and now for them. Yeah. Um, whereas, if you talked about prostate or bowel, you can forget about it. It's not in it's not in their domain at the moment, um, but it's what what you know it's what they listen to in the here and now, um, and if you can engage in in that way as well, it can be really powerful. <laughs> Uh, tell me, go ahead, Janice. Yeah, come Thanks, Lachlan. Uh, something we've done as well, apart from obviously engaging with men and, and men's organisations, is to develop some kind of in house personas, kind of mapping some scenarios of a, a typical, you know, 18 year old, a 40 year old. And that just helps to inform our development in house, thinking about as much as we can, kind of putting ourselves in the shoes of different, uh, different life stages or different circumstances. I, th I think that's a really good point. The fact that as men, we're kind of like going, oh, sure, we know everything. We don't. Uh, and it's the fact that if we can highlight, just hammer, like even when I said in my presentation, everyone knows they need to do more exercise. Well, they do, but they, they don't do it. Um, and I said, some people won't realize the impact of particularly with cancer screening and everything else. And there's a question in the chat there about like with farmers and there's a lot of big good work that's been done with farmers, but it's like, oh, sure, I don't need to do this. Um, I do also kind of think that, you know, the aspect is timing. Like we changed the timing of our programs to 6.15 to 7.15 because of Champions wow. League. And all of a sudden we got a much better intake because guys didn't miss Champions League on a Tuesday and yeah. a Wednesday night. So it's the little things on those fronts that might, you know, have a positive impact on what you can deliver and how you can engage with those men. Very good. And speaking of champions, uh, other kinds of champions, uh, Janice and uh, Helen, especially, you know, you have well-known champions. Is it important to have well-known champions? And does that have an impact? Um, and even yourself, Peter, local champions that obviously are respected in the community. Is that a really important part of the action of, of the what of men's health? Anybody? I think it is. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it just offers the opportunity to extend the reach of our campaign and it offers the opportunity to get more high level kind of profile uh, for the campaign. But, you know, something we're very mindful of was that the rugby players came across as relatable in terms of that they're not, you know, in the elite athlete space anymore, that they have um, retired and have some of the same challenges that we all have in terms of leading healthy lifestyles and, you know, that they were exposed that vulnerability in terms of you know I don't have the nutritionist and the conditioning coach and all the rest of it anymore and you know I, I I'm a dad who's trying to be active for my kids and I think that was really important how we framed that and then also very much complemented by the powerful stories of private citizens and their own journeys as well so we're mindful of again having that range having that flexibility because different things are going to speak to different people
people and you know not all men uh, necessarily look up to, to rugby players as role models so we're mindful of that in the campaign development. I, th I think it's a I, I agree that I think it's a hybrid model for me like um, you look across it men will see their heroes and if heroes are vulnerable then they can relate to that like I'm watching um, the, the Hell Week, whatever it is, when all these celebrities are out in the moment on an island in Cork. And you, you, I heard Barry Murphy speaking there. Like Barry Murphy, to me, an international rugby player, and he's very open about the struggles he has had and other men that are on there. And I would say that not just the high profile um, aspect of local people, like we've done a lot of what we call local, so like Steve in the video there, like he's relatable. People, I can look yeah, at Steve yeah. and go, that's me. If I see a gym monkey who's massive saying, as, as Steve said, I'm not going to go because I'm going, well, for straight off, I'm not getting into a room with that fella. So, you know, it's it's making sure it's relatable that people can go, do you know what? There's going to be other people who are like me, so I feel comfortable. And as soon as you can get someone comfortable and they feel as though they can achieve and they want to be in an environment, you can make massive strides. And I, I would like echo everything that Peter and Janice have said there too, Lurkin, because this year, you know, we, we've had the sports celebrities and we've had the comedians and this year we've come, we've come back to, you know, our men in Ireland who have prostate cancer telling their stories um, and the reality of that. Because, again, sometimes you can move, like, it's great to have uh, the celebrity um, and they, the, the reach is much, much further, but sometimes you just need to be, it needs to be, be local and, and be sensitive to the people around them, you know, and I think that works really well as well. All, all of you have demonstrated really clearly your organization's commitment and the activities and the actions and the clarity of the outcome that's there. And I'm just wondering, we won't add up the, the, the working years experience that's between the three of you here now, uh, but I'm just wondering, based on that experience, organization to them personal, what, what exactly piece of advice would you give to other service providers maybe looking in today and wanting to be part of the what of men's health, you know, the action What's the key thing that would be on your postage stamp as a teacher used to ask a few years ago in school? What's on your postage stamp that you would say, Helen, you have anything that would... In, yeah, in your I learning? mean, I'd, I'd, still come, I'd still come back to, like, you know, that whole um, ethos of trying to make cancer less frightening, you know, um, trying to, like, deliver that positive story, you know, that there is hope and that and actually that there are a huge amount of survivors in Ireland living well with cancer. And simply to talk about it and get that support, you know, to open up and, and talk about it. And um, women do it very well still. And I, I believe I've worked with men for a long time. I believe they do too, but they do it even better if they've connected with somebody in, this, in a similar space. Pete, do you want to say anything about that? Sure. Yeah, I, I think it's the same thing. It's like, don't think we know everything. I think learn, like be a sponge, absorb from, I learned from Helen and Janice and their organizations and many different organizations. And we're very lucky in sports partnership land that we learn from each other, but we've created that network. And I'll phone some of my colleagues across the country saying, what's working for you? Um, but also be aware of where you live. Like I highlighted in my video, we live in Waterford. So we've unique characteristics of Waterford and how Waterford people live that will affect Waterford men. Um, so don't be afraid to utilize that as well. Um, but I do think think it's that aspect of working together within partnership and that um, spreading the message that whilst men think they're physically active and even with the, the farmers as we said about you know yeah it's a physically demanding job but there's also that social aspect and you know fit, there's different types of physical activity and making sure that it's the holistic approach that men you know we can make sure we work together that men are physically emotionally and socially better we're better individuals um and i think that's that would be the big thing i've learned don't be afraid to try new things you know don't just go this is my one program bang get across the county and talk to men find out what they want okay and janice can i ask you a question you can come in on that one as well but it's probably linked to it because we're talking about you know maybe engaging men um, and the what of that in the context of probably being relatively fit but both yourself and I know Helen especially, you know, you'd have many men who are in recovery. And, you know, so physical activity is a very different picture. And I'm just wondering, you know, it has been asked as a question, but what's out there or how can that be approached in relation? Maybe somebody, for example, who's coming back from a stroke or in recovery from cancer and, and what's there in relation to, especially physical activity and getting out there and making those links. Thanks, Lorcan. Yes, and, and thanks to the person who asked the question. Um, yeah, physical activity is a, a really important part and, and it can often be a concern for somebody who's had a stroke or a heart event 
they they might be, know that they should be more active for for their um management of their condition but concerned about you know doing it and, and that's where we come in in terms of supporting people so for example our stroke support services we have regional weekly online activity sessions with a trained um uh, physical activity expert who's very experienced in that patient support space and i think it's about building confidence as much as the as, as the actual activity itself and again meeting like-minded people who are all on that same journey together so um, our stroke support services are uh, very active in that area and i suppose for for ourselves larkin um in in as part of the survive and thrive program um we we make action plans with um the participants every week you know for, through that six-week journey um, and those action plans are self-management, but they're also um, very measurable um, goals. You know, they're realistic. We try to make them realistic and that's about self-management. So we try to make them realistic as, as they go week on week. And we, we ask them for confidence levels. So it makes them think about, is this something I can do? Is it achievable or is it too much? And it's actually kind of, you know, getting them ready to, to get back out into their new world um, uh, and uh, sustain what they've learned. And I know Peter talked a lot about that. Sustainability is so important. It's, it's not just for six weeks and it's not just for a program, it's for life, you know? And obviously it probably needs to be readdressed and revisited from time to time. And I think that from that from our perspective as well, it's, um, as you said, it's that, that engagement, that sustainability with men to find out exactly where they, they are at, which is really, really important. Um, and as I said, even we are evolving. We're not as far down the line as Janice and Helen with the resources that maybe we have. We're, we're kind of like firing machine gun bullets around to make sure we can hit home sometimes. But we, we, we work, we have a PAC project, which is um, people with, um, who are living with chronic conditions. So we've, because of findings that we've had and feedback we've had, we're now working with the HSC and like three other sports parties to come up with guidelines and programs that we can deliver safely in a safe environment. But whilst also most of our programs, they are accessible. So we try and make sure you heard some of our, in my video that it's tailored to men. Like we have asked men for giving their goals pre-program and it's worked very well sometimes. Um, but I, I think what Helen says there is really important to get someone to buy into something. You have to get them to actually say, what do you want? Tell us what you want so we can help you to achieve that result. And if you do that, again, you can make some great strides. Thank you very much, Peter. That's not a bad place to end, you know, that conversation that we're saying to people, tell us what you want, help us to shape what will be a successful what and engagement, especially for men. Folks, it's been really fantastic that you've been here today. I know that anybody looking in can see your passion and see the, you know, the amount of time and work that you're doing organizationally and indeed personally as well, to make a difference to the lives of men and being part of the plot of engaging men as well. So thank you very, very much for that. We have Fergus coming in and we're running on time here. So we want to promise to let everybody out on time out of school. So Fergus, would you like to come in and bring us up to date on where we're going next and some of the updates in relation to men's thank health? You very, thank you very much, Lorcan. Um, I appreciate that. And I'd like to second your thanks and appreciation for all the speakers today. Helen, Janice and Peter put so much uh, to today's webinar and you really got the messages across really well. Uh, so we're delighted that you really kind of invested. Or I know your, your organizations are investing in men's health on an ongoing basis, as you showed today. And uh, we really, um, I suppose, see the, the benefits no more than Peter said around the partnership. The Irish Heart Foundation um, has been a key you know, supporter and ally and delivery unit for the men's health work over the years. And, uh, you know, Helen gave a very great insight into the work of the Mary Keating Foundation and Peter um, described his work very well, but also kind of give insight into the sports partnerships around the country. And we shared the link for the sports partnerships around the country on the chat and we'll share it again in the follow up email. So thanks very much to Lorcan and, uh, and the guys there for the presentations today. And, and I suppose uh, this is the third, as Lorcan said, the third Engaging Men webinar, and I'm, I'm really delighted we chose that theme. It seems to be going very well, and it seems to be the key theme, really, where we need to go and drive things. Like, essentially, you know, COVID is still here, uh, where hopefully things are opening up in the next month or so, a bit more, and we'll be having more face-to-face -face contact, more engagement opportunity for people that are targeting men. You'll be hopefully talking to more people in your communities. Um, 
a lot of the people on this webinar are you know trying to target men in their own work or they're here because they're interested in men's health from their own personal perspective or in their family community context so um i suppose we're we're looking to you know we're looking forward very positively and and the messages that are coming with this engaging webinars series are exactly what we need over the next year or two when we're essentially in recovery mode for for been turned upside down over the last two years so um, i'm delighted with that the first webinar we had back in april was the why then in men's health week we had the how today was the what and we have the when on uh, on the 19th of november uh, we'll be uh, doing that, uh, which is International Men's Day, which that's why I suppose that's when we're doing it. That's why we're doing it then. International Men's Day gives us an opportunity to talk about men's health and the health of, of boys as well. Um, and one of the, the focus we're trying to take on that one is some of the work that we've done in relation to farmer uh, health and wellbeing. And again, some of the partners involved here today and, and listening in the background have been, you know, doing a lot of work in relation to some of those initiatives. So we hope to give you more insight into our On Firm Ground initiative, which is led by Lorcan's organization, the Men's Development Network, but has lots of allies um, in the men's health field and is, is funded by ourselves in the HSC, but also the Department of Health and Department of Agriculture, where we're, we're training um, agricultural uh, consultants to bring a health and wellbeing conversation into farmyards around the country. Uh, so we hopefully give you a lot more insight into that in on our November webinar and would also hope to report on our Farmers Out of Hearts initiative, which is again, a big alliance of organizations, supporters from Chagask and uh, IT Carlo and a number of uh, supporting people in the background. Um, but we, we should have a report to, to bring you some findings in relation to the evaluation around that work, uh, which will be very exciting. So that's November 19th. We'll share the, the, the registration link maybe with you now before we finish up. And uh, the other things that are coming up in, in our world in HSC Health and Wellbeing, we have a, an obesity webinar next week, which is, you know, it's not just about men, but it's a very important issue for, for lots of men and people working with men. And the Obesity Let's Talk event is on the 7th. And it's a it's a afternoon evening event from three to seven. It's a webinar. So we'll share the link in that in the follow-up email. And that's for anybody working in the health service or anybody any member of the public that's interested in learning more about overweight or obesity and the issues that we're that we're trying to work with through there so look at I'll, I'll leave it there and um just thank you all for your attendance and, and time you're given to this we really appreciate it and the support you're giving us in passing on the messages and the information that you're getting through these webinars thank you everybody thank you fergal and just a final word before you go do go well and mind each other well in the world, it's, uh, you know, we, we all need one another. I like that line from Peter, we do much better together. So that's worth keeping in mind. Thank you to our panelists and for their presentations. I'm sure loads of people got loads from uh, spending time with us today. I hope that is the fact. And to Helena and her team in IMS, thank you for minding us as well here technically. We really appreciate that as well. So until the next time, stay well and go well. And we look forward to seeing you soon.